Uh, all right, so we'll go ahead and get started with, um, actually before I do that, I'm going to introduce myself just a little bit. And I apologize, I feel bad because I can't see you now, but um, we'll go ahead and uh, kind of work through that. Um, so again, as um, Cheryl mentioned, my name is Marianne Doyle. I am the Director of Human Resources and Equity Services for the William S. Hart High School District. And I'm a faculty member at Cal State University Northridge. The courses that I typically teach are um, one foot in administration. And so I teach in the doctoral program as well as the master's program there. And I teach the diversity and equity course for our credential candidates. Um, and I am very fortunate to be here today. And I'm also very excited that our keynote speaker already spoke a little bit to this, but um, again, honoring the lands, the native lands that we are meeting on. I'm sharing this with you. And by the way, the entire presentation is in PDF form in the folder that was shared. Um, so if you wanted to use any of this, please feel free to do so. I was able to utilize this particular um, uh, honoring um, documentation, if you will, or honoring uh, uh, speech, if you will, um, with regards to our native tribes from another uh, presenter a long time ago. And so I've continued to use it for several years and I revisited it for my particular tribe in Santa Clarita, which is where I'm from. Um, and so the Tatayan people are who I'd like to honor today. And if you wouldn't mind sharing the lands that you are honoring, or if you weren't part of the keynote, I'm going to also share the same link um, where you are able to actually look up the different native lands. If uh, you'd like to include those, please feel free to pop, to pop those in the chat. I will continue to talk as you do so through a little bit of norms and expectations. Um, so I want to enter a courageous space. Some of you may be familiar with the work by Glenn Singleton around courageous spaces. And I wanted to um, kind of begin by starting out with our norms. And so the big piece for me is to ask questions. I am actually monitoring the chat on my screen. So feel free to pop any conversation questions, any comments, and I'll continue to look over and make sure that I catch um, everything that is being stated. And I'm sure Cheryl will help me if I miss anything as well. And then as I um, continue forward, I wanted to make sure that you also feel free to do a number of different things, like just keep it real. Some of the conversation that we'll have will be a little bit difficult, but I wanna make sure that as we enter a courageous space, we feel really comfortable with keeping it real. Um, and part of that is that speaking order. And so I will also keep an eye on our participant pane so that we make sure to respond to questions as you use that raised hand, because I can't see you. I can't see an actual um, physical raised hand. So please do use the um, the icon on the bottom. And then finally, that step up and step back. I wanted to just address that very briefly. It's really important that we each step up and have the opportunity to um, share our voices, but then also to provide space for others. So as we see others engaging in the conversation to provide that space for them to do so. From an expectations perspective, we acknowledge one another as individuals and as diverse individuals in this space. And it's important to me and to all of us, I think, to go hard on the issues and not on the people. So even as we might have divergent um, perspectives, it's important to really look at things from an issue perspective, not a personal piece. Nina, in the um, folder that, Cheryl, if you don't mind finding that link, I'm sorry, I don't have it handy, um, to the folder that has all of the resources through every single presentation that we are providing through this conference. Um, Cheryl, we'll put the link in the chat for everyone. Um, you'll be able to download, and, and mine is actually labeled, the presentation is actually labeled using the same name of the, uh, of the conference presentation. There's a bunch of other resources that I've popped in there as well for you. So if there are any questions or any concerns about the norms or expectations, please feel free to raise your hand or let me know. And I'm just going to share just really quickly about my own personal story. So I've had a really wonderful arc um, in my career. Uh, I actually didn't start in education. I started in the hospitality industry, and I hopefully will have time to make a couple quick comments about that a little bit later. Um, but when I came to education 21 years ago now, I started working in adult education. I worked in ESL and I taught high school English in 10th grade in a suburb of Los Angeles. Um, the majority of my students were actually on um, probation. And I also, of course, had 
every kind of student, every walk of life. Um, it was a really interesting experience because I came from a much more privileged school as a high school student. Um, and so really walking into a very diverse and different kind of experience where, so, where I had homeless students, I had students that were struggling with, um, uh, with uh, hunger, you know, with, uh, with food insecurities, um, with different kinds of situations in their home life. Um, and so it was really difficult for me to engage in that particular era. And I think that the other piece was that as a new teacher, we were being told back then not to really share with our students very much about ourselves personally, um, and not really to connect in that personal space, which was just such a tragedy. Um, I really was I benefited from the fact that I had two parents in education. Uh, my mother and father were both teachers. And uh, my father in particular really just did an incredible work in this place of um, connecting with students. And so he was um, and continues to be that pinnacle of what I look to, you know, what I put on a pedestal of, of great teaching. And so he's he continues to be that person in my life. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit to you today about how central student voices in this work, but I'm going to get there by really talking to you about this recent work that I've been doing, which has been in equity and in human resources, and um, just some of the questions that I've really been faced with. All of us have gone through COVID together, so we all know from a reflection perspective that we've had significant time to really think about what's important to ourselves and to um, our families now uh, now that we've been through this time in this space. Um, and so some of that for me has been um, particularly intense as we've looked at the turnover rates with our teachers and our administrators and folks that are leaving and moving into different positions, sometimes within our institution, but also a lot of the times without, you know, outside of our institution. So I've been really kind of wrestling with what causes people to stay, what causes people to leave. And I've been looking at this in three different spaces. As a teacher of teachers in the credential program, as a um, administrator in human resources, and as someone who is looking at practice in the actual classroom, what does engagement look like? And what does retention look like? And what causes it? And so as we've been reflective, and as you've been reflective, I'm sure part of what you've questioned is where do I, where does happiness come from? You know, and at least for me, I'll share my personal perspective and experiences. We've always been go, 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 whether it's from my career, whether it's from having a commute for several years prior to this position. I've been very, very fortunate and blessed to be in a position now where it's a 15 to 20 minute commute versus an hour and a half, which is what I was um, doing before I took this position. Um, was it, uh, uh, you know, the running back and forth with the kids and, and commutes and so forth um, to different practices? And at the end of the day, what's most important? Where is the best value for the entire family? Um, and so I came upon a lot of human resources research. And one researcher asks this particular question and he says that this is how we might come to an understanding point blank of joy. And, and are we um, successfully achieving joy? And so I'm gonna ask this of you in your, um, position. Absolutely. It's a great question, Nina. Where does that happiness come from? But I'm going to ask you specifically in your position, in your job, how much do you enjoy your job on a typical school day? And we could ex um, extend this question to our students by asking them, how much do you enjoy school on a typical school day? But I'm going to ask this of you right now. So this was going to be a poll, but instead I'm going to put this as um, a chat perspective. And, or I'm, I'm sorry, you know what, I'm gonna do it a little bit differently. Let's do a raised hand, if it's okay, if you feel comfortable. And I wanted the poll to be anonymous. This is a little bit less anonymous. So if you're uncomfortable responding, that's perfectly fine. Um, but if you would do a raised hand for uh, under measuring joy, how much do you enjoy your job on a typical school day? If you enjoy your job 110%, use the raised hand function. Let's see if we can see the numbers there. And by the way, again, no, no judgment zone, right? That's exciting. Okay. 
And then, wow, there's a lot of 110%. That's great. Okay. If you enjoy your job 50% of the time, if you, those of you that are at that 100% or 110%, if you'll lower your hands, um, if you enjoy your job 50% of the time, please feel free to raise your hand. We'll watch those numbers kind of shift around. And then if you enjoy your job, so about around 10 or 12, um, if you enjoy your job about 20% of the time, please raise your hand. Thank you, feel free to lower your hand. So you can kind of see that there's quite the spread, right? Um, we're very fortunate, I think, because we're in this place where I think a lot of us are super passionate about what we do, that our um, connections with students and so forth really means so much to us. Um, and so, you know, a lot of you are in that 110% range, but there's also a, a significant amount of us that are 50% and below. It's actually more if you looked at the numbers, there's more of us that are at that 50% and below. And so what's interesting is really hearing, and um, just so that I make sure that I don't miss out on any of you, I'm going to go in here and just lower hands. And then if you actually had a question, feel free to raise your hand again. Um, but really, if you kind of take a look at that and think about, oh my gosh, okay, so if there's that huge disparity, what does that mean in the workplace? And then conversely, if we talk about it from a teaching and learning perspective, what does that mean in the classroom? So as I said, in transitioning to HR, I'm kind of back in the business world. You know, I left industry after, gosh, about, uh, I had about 12 years in industry, came into education kind of some at the same time, because otherwise I'd already probably be retirement age, right? Um, so I've had contiguous, con or um, I've had careers that were simultaneous, I should say. Um, but nonetheless, coming back to industry and doing some more of this industry-related research, I've come across Paul Zak, who does a lot of work in this neuroscience of trust. He's got decades worth of research in this space. And he's actually, through his research, made a direct correlation between joy and trust in the workplace. And I would extend that into the classroom. When we have trust in the classroom, there's a significant sense of happiness. And I'll explain a little bit that as we continue that conversation around the neuroscience component of it, but there's a, there is a direct correlation between the joy we have in our classrooms and the joy that we have in the workplace and, and what fosters joy in those spaces to, our, to that um, trust perspective and vice versa. So let's talk a little bit about, again, kind of, I'm gonna steep you a little bit in business and we'll flip back and forth between business and education research. But in the business world, Richard Finnegan is another um, researcher and he does some work through the Society of Human Resource Management around the power of stay interviews. And these are the five questions that he advocates to employers to ask of employees. Um, and there's a quote from him that I don't have on the slide, but basically what he says, you know, there's, there's this, significant um, focus around human resources being how you um, inspire folks to stay in positions. And that means through compensation, and that means through um, you know, the different kinds of activities that we do in the workplace in order to keep people in the workplace, right? What he says is actually, HR is not responsible for retaining employees or engaging them. It's the boss, it's the leaders of the organization. And I would correlate that to our classroom teachers. And I would correlate that to us as our as teacher educators as well. And so um, when you travel to work, what do you look forward to is the very first question that Richard Finnegan adv advocates for leaders to ask their employees. Um, on an annual basis, if not more frequently, to kind of test and see how excited people are to come to work and if they want to stay. And then he talks about, well, what, what are you learning right now? Or what is it that you want to learn? Are we asking our students those kinds of questions, both in the teacher education programs, as well as hopefully passing that on to um, students in the classroom? And number three is so powerful. Why do you stay here? Why do you stay here? 
Number four, when was the last time you thought about leaving and why did you change your mind? That's such a critical question to ask, such a critical question. And number five is probably the most important of them all. What can I do as a leader to make working here better for you? And how can I be a better leader to you? If you replace leader with teacher, if you replace leader with teacher, think about how powerful it would be to have that conversation with students. So the number one reason employees stay or leave, disengage or engage, is how much they trust their bosses. So that trust component is a huge piece. So I'm gonna connect really quick um, to uh, what I experienced in the hospitality industry. I actually, one of my favorite companies that I worked for, and I worked for a lot of them, was Marriott. And the Marriott way is that you take care of your employees so that the employee takes care of the customer. And so if you really think about that laddered effect, um, in the work that you do as a teacher educator, as you take care of those teachers and you foster that trust and maybe even assist them with that trust relationship that's at the institutions that they're interning at, how could that then be passed into the classroom? How does that impact and affect the students in the classroom? And, you know, at the end of the day, I started teaching 21 years ago, and you all know this. I know I'm speaking to the choir, but at the end of the day, our data has not improved. In 21 years that I've been in the industry, our data has not improved on teacher retention, right? So some of the stats that I pulled, 44% um, to 50% of new teachers continue to leave the profession. That really depends on which report you look at, but it's between 44 or 50% leave within five years. I know you all know that. NASP um, published a report that says that 40% of our students never even go into the profession. So they never even leave our programs and enter the profession. That's huge. And then of the ones that do, 50% of them actually quit the profession prior to the retirement age. Why? What's going on there? And on an annual basis, 8% leave the profession, but another 8% shift around in the profession. So we really have a 16% turnover rate on an, 18, on an annual basis. And then, you know, conversely, different, again, different um, uh, reports give you different data. So Learning Policy Institute actually says that two thirds of our teachers leave the profession prior to retirement. So how do we increase teacher engagement and retention? And then conversely, how does that move from teachers to students? So that takes me into this idea of trust. And I've um, actually renamed the presentation just a little bit by making sure to, to honor the fact that trust is so central to the work that we're doing. Um, we're able to really look at this work through this space of trust. So Paul's Axe Research, once again, here's his rationale why trust is important in the workplace. And again, why I am arguing that trust is important in the classroom. 40% less burnout, 106% more energy, 76% more engagement, and on and on and on. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of the context. This comes from Zarita Hammond's work. Um, this is actually the textbook that I use when I teach my diversity and equity course for our credential students. So feel free to take a look at this one. It's actually been very powerful. Last year was um, the first time I used it and I continue to hear from my teacher candidates that interned this last semester um, about how important this work was for them, even in their internships. Um, and so it's culturally responsive teaching in the brain. And uh, so it really centers the work that we're doing from a cultural responsive and anti-racist perspective within this um, space of neuroscience. And so breaking down that limbic region, you've got these three central areas that are part of that limbic region. And so some of you may have heard of something called the lizard brain. Well, that's your brain stem and it's connected to the reticular activating system or RAS or RAS, right? So that's that part of the brain there that's constantly scanning the environment and looking for threats, right? So it's this part of the brain that's saying, oh, there's this thing over here that's a threat. Now, how do I activate? The amygdala is actually that guard dog then that communicates to the reticular activating system to say, ooh, threat, respond. The amygdala releases cortisol. All a lot of you are already familiar with cortisol as the stress hormone, right? So the amygdala says, cortisol, you need to do one of these activities. You either flee, you fight, or you appease, or, um, or you freeze, right? So you've got these four instinctive actions that take place thanks to um, our, our you know, lizard brain, our amygdala telling our, our uh, watcher system 
hey, the body needs to react in this way instantaneously to protect itself for survival. The hippocampus is where all of that working memory exists. And so part of what in, in, interacts there is our history, our, um, our history of experiences, which includes trauma. This is really a big part of our trauma-informed um, classrooms and instruction, right? So our hippocampus tells us, hey, here's some stuff that's happened to us in the past, and here's how um, the reactions have either been positive or negative. And so this is how we're going to behave going forward, right? When the amygdala takes action and cortisol is released, the executive functioning part of the brain that you don't really see on this diagram, it just doesn't get to work anymore because we're in, we're in those four phases. We're in fight, flight, freeze, or appease. That's all. We don't have the opportunity to do anything else from an executive function perspective because we're just in survival mode at that point. So what Dr. Hammond talks about is that fear and trust really have this an, an inverse relationship. And I didn't know that cortisol can stay in the body up to three hours and basically no learning will happen for 20 minutes. So once that's, that reaction is activated, we're done. We're done for a good 20 minutes. And if you teach high school out of a 55 minute period, you're, you're pretty much done with that period. And that's something that she, she um, Ca uh, captures in the book as amygdala hijack. So basically all of your functions are hijacked by that a fight or flight response or that survival response of the brain. On the flip side of it, the reason trust is so important is it actually deactivates the amygdala and it activates um, oxytocin. So it deactivates the ability to release cortisol into the bloodstream. And again, that that survival instinct. And instead, what trust does is it allows you to, pr to produce oxytocin and that connects us back to joy. That allows us to have joy in the classroom. And check out the data there. And this comes from Paul Zak, this piece of data. What he says is that all, in his decades worth of research, he identified an effect size of 0.77 for joy when they, you have both higher sense of purpose, which we'll talk about towards the end of the presentation, and trust. You have trust in that classroom, you have trust in that, um, in that workplace environment, and you have this effect size of 0.77. For some of you, that may not mean anything, but that is huge effect size for, from a research perspective, right? So Zarita Hammond, going back to her work, she talks about how at the core of positive relationships is trust. And so that sense of releasing oxytocin is, or that, that function rather of releasing oxytocin is because you feel safe. You feel safe and you feel relaxed. The culturally responsive teacher uses this information all the time. You're constantly being reflected and thinking about, okay, well, how do I make that authentic connection with my students? And this again, let's go back to Marriott Way. This is a multi-layered approach. This is us as the teacher educators working with our future teachers and those future teachers working with the students in the classroom. We have that, that um, compounded effect as a result of our work in this space. So I would love, I don't know why space bar isn't working for me. Sorry about that. I would love to at, get some more of your feedback. And so we're gonna do a little activity that will utilize the chat box again, but it's a little bit different. I'm gonna ask you to start typing your response to the question that you see here, which says, how might implicit bias, microaggressions, of, or other manners of marginalization cause amygdala hijack and prohibit learning? What I'm gonna ask you to do is not press enter. You're gonna type your response in the chat, but you're not gonna press enter until I say the word waterfall. So that'll give us all time collectively to reflect on our um, own thinking before we see other responses. And then we'll all respond simultaneously and take a couple moments to reflect, okay? So it's called a waterfall activity. It's really helpful for those of us that, and I know for, for CSUN, we're gonna still be from predominantly in um, the virtual space in the fall. So it's a neat um, activity to use from a Zoom perspective going forward for, for you if you'd like. So we're gonna experiment with this. So I'm gonna be quiet for a couple seconds here. And if you would type your response, and when I say waterfall, go ahead and press enter. This is so great, absolutely. People feel put off. They see these within themselves and they immediately respond with that. Freeze, fight, flight, absolutely. Perceptions of threat, yes. 
immediate release of cortisol. Putting up those barriers, yep. Oh gosh, isn't that the worst when you're in the classroom and the, you see it, it's, it's visible when the bar barrier goes up, isn't it? And you know you're done, you know you're done as a teacher. Trigger point, the anger and resentment, yeah. Oh, great reflection, yeah, fear of seeing the wrong thing both on the students end and hey, on us as teachers too, right? If a person feels threatened, they're busy trying to find safety. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh, you guys are so insightful. Thank you so much. Bias can cause a, a student not to feel any trust. Lowered self-esteem. Oh, isn't that the most painful part of it all? Well, one of the most painful parts of it all. Past trauma, yeah, absolutely devaluing ideas and lived experiences. That's such an important part of connecting. Thank you all for participating and, and for sharing your voices on this. It is so important. And you really allow me to segue um, for a brief moment on this anti-racist perspective that we have had some talk about over really the, well, unfortunately, just the past year, although this work has existed for some time, um, many of us have really just kind of started to scratch the surface. But what Zarita Hammond talks about is that every culturally responsive teacher develops a socio-political consciousness and understanding that we lived in a race or that we live in a racialized society that gives unearned privilege to some, while others experience unearned disadvantage because of race, gender, class, language. And she also goes on to say that the culturally responsive teacher is aware of the role that schools play in both perpetuating and challenging those inequities. They are also aware of the impact of their own cultural lens on interpreting and evaluating students' individual or collective behavior that might lead to low expectations or undervalued knowledge and skills that they bring to the school. And I want to underscore that. I'm seeing that in your responses here already, but I want to underscore this comment of low expectations or undervalued knowledge and skills that they bring to school. That is an important component of really establishing trust is ensuring that students know that we value their context and their, their already heightened um, uh, skill set that they have, that they bring from home. We've spent so much time, unfortunately, in our educational community devaluing a lot of what students bring to the table. So we'll jump back to Paul Zak. He's used the beautiful acronym here of, uh, of oxytocin to create this, to remember, how do we inspire trust? The number one thing that both Zach and Hammond talk about is recognizing excellence. Celebrate when students are successful. Celebrate when your students in your classrooms are successful and allow them to see a model of what that looks like for when they go into the K-12 classroom. Induce that challenge stress and give people discretion in how they work. I'm going to actually forward a little bit here to Paul Zach um, in his own video explaining these eight steps. But before I do that, let me include here, this is just a strategy. Some of you probably have already used the I am pro, um, poems, but one way to connect, to, to begin those connections, to build trust is to really hear your students' stories. I used this last year with my credential students and it was so insightful um, and important to them. They keep going back to it actually. So I'm sharing that just to kind of scaffold a little bit um, as a strategy you might choose to use. But don't forget that, you know, we talked a little bit about this trauma, really that, that experience by students of color, it is pervasive in their lives. Um, and, it's that sense of microaggressions kind of being death by a thousand paper cuts. Uh, I heard um, our keynote reference Tyrone Howard. I heard him very early in the, um, in the pandemic. And then Dr. Alicia Montgomery just published an article on this. But some of our students of color preferred the online learning experience because they didn't have to deal with the daily microaggressions, the, the momentary, every moment, minute by minute microaggressions that occur in their classrooms, on their way to school, leaving school, in the school yard. They didn't have to deal with any of that. They just dealt with school. They just learned. And so they found themselves feeling much more, much more comfortable 
um, in the online environment than they did in the in the face to face classroom environment, even though in some instances, maybe the face to face might have been a better teaching and learning experience for them. It wasn't worth it because of everything that they experience as students of color in the environment in our educational institutions. We have work to do right that aggregate of those microaggressions death by a thousand paper cuts it's just too damaging for them. Um, and actually what was interesting is Dr. Howard at points specifically to boys of color, our, our African-American boys in particular seem to prefer uh, to have that Zoom or in his research in Los Angeles seem to prefer to have that online experience in order to avoid the pain that they've experienced. And so that you know establishing the trust is an important component to making sure that we can bring our students into the classroom in any space, whether it's virtual or face-to-face -face and feel comfortable and feel trusting enough um, uh, in order to have that joy. And so I'm gonna share with you, oops, this video from Paul Zak. Um, and he talks about, you'll hear him talk about how work, why isn't work an adventure? Why isn't it about culture and trust? You'll, you'll hear him talk about that. He's gonna go over the eight steps really briefly. It's about three minutes. Um, but I kind of wanted to have you hear him from his uh, mouth again as the researcher of, of like I said, for decades long um, in this space. Companies asks this really simple question, which is, why isn't work an adventure? Cultures are really hot word now in business. We think about how to create high engagement cultures and the research we've done shows that trust is a key component that really makes work exciting, productive and innovative. And our research also identified eight building blocks to create a culture of trust. And these building blocks somehow magically have a nice, easy to remember acronym, oxytocin. O stands for ovation. That's my word for recognizing high performers. X is for expectation. This is setting hard but achievable goals that people can stretch to reach. Y is for yield. This is allowing people to choose how they execute projects. T is for transfer. Transfer is enabling self-management so people control their work lives. O is for openness. That's allowing information to flow both from leaders to employees and in the reverse. C is for caring. That's intentionally building relationships with others at work. I is for invest, and that's enabling both professional and personal growth of those you work with. And N is for natural, and that's allowing your authentic self to be seen and even being vulnerable at work. So it's based on research that I've done showing that this brain chemical oxytocin makes us emotionally connect to those around us, increases our trust in them, and substantially increases the effectiveness of teamwork. In the early 2000s, my lab was the first to discover that the brain chemical oxytocin facilitated trust, generosity, connection to others in a series of experiments in which we create a technology to measure oxytocin synthesis in the brain. We showed that when we are trusted, when someone treats us well, our brain generally makes this chemical and motivates us to respond And whoops, companies. I'm, I've only shared a small um, snippet of this video with you um, because it's quite long and it talks a little bit more about really the book. Um, but I wanted to share that kind of critical component around trust and development of trust, um, and also around you know the the science of it, that oxytocin component of it. Um, you, you'll see that the title here is Learning at the Speed of Trust, and I don't reference enough of his work, but if you haven't read it, um, this is Stephen Covey's The Speed of Trust, and again, it's a business-related book, but my goodness, it's such a critical piece of, um, from a development perspective, it's so critical to learn a lot about how trust in, uh, impacts the classroom and impacts us as uh, teachers of teachers, um, and so I hope that you have the opportunity to, to check it out. There we go. I'm going to move forward a little bit so that we kind of have that connection to the bigger piece, that cognitive insight piece, but I'm going to ask the question, um, if you want to throw in the chat your thoughts of what do you think rapport starts with? This is the equation that Zarita Hammond comes up with in her book on culturally responsive teaching in the brain, and she says, you've got to have rapport, you've got to have alliance in order to have cognitive insight with students. 
what do you think support is, or sorry, rapport is, excuse me. Um, if you wanna pop in the chat your ideas of what rapport might be. Or where it starts, I should say. Genuine interest in others, absolutely. Listening. Authentic listening, yes. Trusting relationships, friendship, trust, worth, warmth, excuse me, authentic conversations. Openness, listening and being present. Vulnerability to be transparent, build expectations, model authenticity, and open face. Love your responses. And you're right. Trust and safe environment, caring and openness. Everything that you're talking about, these elements, they're coming from this space of trust. You're absolutely right. Safe and safe relationship where trust has been established. Assuming goodwill. Absolutely, absolutely. So Zarita Hammond talks about, we've got to generate trust. What can we do to generate trust? I'm going to throw this in here. We're going to take two minutes to do this. It's a short, I don't know if all of you have had um, the, the opportunity to engage with Padlet as a teaching and learning tool. I've used it for, gosh, at least, I don't know, 10, 12 years now. Um, it's such an uh, easy tool to use. Um, I highly recommend it if you haven't in the past. And I don't know if this is going to work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop share and reshare so you can kind of see how to do this. Hang on one second. Uh, new share. Here it is. Trust generators. So great. Yeah, someone's already using it. So to use Padlet, you just click on the link that's in the chat and then just click anywhere. And you'll get this little box. And you can title it or not. And just write a quick comment here of how you generate trust in the classroom. What are some of the things that you can do? So for example, I might generate trust by using the I am poem and other activities as an example, and then just click outside of it and you're able to post immediately your, um, your comment. And I'm sharing this because I'm hoping that we can have this collective space that maybe we might be able to reflect back on, right? Um, and maybe be able to use in our own classrooms. Oh, this is so great. Thank you. Thank you for being, gosh, right there with me and, and actively participating in this. This is such an important piece of what we do is just generating that trust and teaching our students and our, our future teachers. How do you even do that? I didn't know how to do that as a first year teacher. I had no idea. I had no idea. I'm going to hone in on a couple of the comments that I see here that talk about listening. Oh, wow. That, that is a presentation in and of itself. Listening is a undervalued tool in establishing trust. It is absolutely undervalued. And just being able to, you know, we talk about teacher wait times. If we could utilize that in our in our day to day teaching and in our classrooms as we teach future teachers, it's not just wait time. It's really listening without thinking about your answer. <laughs> That's what we do. I mean, it's it's an American culture piece, right? Uh, back to hospitality industry. My first hotel was Sheraton, and it was owned by a Japanese company that also happened to own schools um, in uh, uh, schools in uh, in Japan. Um, and so we had a lot of Japanese school groups that would come into that particular Sheraton. Um, and what was fascinating to me was really learning about listening from the owners and the operators of that hotel. They were so mindful of the conversation. And when you spoke, there, were, there was no issue with awkward silences. We have this horrible sense of awkward silence, right, on our end. Silence was valued in the Japanese culture as I was growing up and learning. And so not feeling like you have to fill that space, but guess what, as good listeners in the American culture, if we're able to hold that space, it's so uncomfortable to have an awkward silence that you'll learn more about your students in conversation. I'm gonna give you a quick challenge on listening. Try to have a conversation with one of your students where you only ask questions. You deliberately never make a statement. Just try as an experiment for fun for yourself and see what happens. 
see what happens. And I'll bet you, I don't know if you know this, but the research says that in conversation, the person who talks the most thinks that the conversation went the best. Person who talks the most thinks the conversation went the best. Imagine how powerful that is with your students. And then if you transparently share that tool with your students so that they can use it with their students in K-12, ah, can you imagine the power of that with some of our most traumatized students in our K-12 classrooms? And frankly, frankly, in our credential program, because the stories that my students shared with me about their lives that led them to become teachers were so powerful and so heartbreaking. And I'm, I'm getting teared up when I'm thinking about them right now. But if we could just kind of consider that power of listening, that power of asking questions. Thank you so much again for sharing in the Padlet all of your ideas. This is beautiful. This is really beautiful. I'm going to take time after this presentation to reflect on this and digest it and get a better understanding of some of the tools that you all use because it is, this is gonna improve my teaching practice. So I thank you. I thank you so much. Um, Lisa, I will download the Padlet as a PDF and I'll put it in the folder. Absolutely, you got it. I'm gonna go back. Please feel free to continue to add if you would like. And I'm gonna go back to the presentation to share with you Zarita Hammond's um, ideas around trust generators. This exact document, the full document is actually in the folder. So if you wanna use it as you're teaching, you put, feel free to pull it. It's a um, chart from her book, but I've got it actually separated out. Corwin provides it as a separate handout. So I thought I'd share it here with you as well. That selective vulnerability piece is such a powerful component. Like I was talking about before, 21 years ago when I started teaching, I did not know how to do that. And I was too young. That was part of it. I was 22, 21, excuse me, um, teaching 10th graders. So I might've been a little bit too close to their age. Um, but really, honestly, what turned it around was when I came home and I told my dad that I didn't want to teach anymore um, because I just couldn't do it anymore. I was coming home and crying every night because I just couldn't handle the pain, and here's the link to this, by the way, if you want the electronic. Um, I couldn't handle the daily pain of hearing about the trauma that my students had, were going through. I was young, I didn't understand, I couldn't believe that young people so close to my age were suffering as much as they were. Um, and so I really struggled through it. And my father was a, an amazing, amazing teacher, as I mentioned, but he was also an amazing dad. He never got mad. This was the first time. He'd ever gotten mad at me in my entire life, but I could remember was when I was 21, first year teacher. And he turned to me and he said, your problem is you don't love your students enough. You don't love your students enough. And he said, you're not quitting. You'll turn around and you'll go back to your classroom and you're gonna love them. And I was angry and I kind of fought against him mentally, um, but uh, I went back in the classroom and what I did with that selective vulnerability that I didn't do consciously, I just, you know, I didn't really, you know, calculate it, if you will, I just kind of blurted it out. But it was so powerful was I went in the classroom and I said to the students, I said, you know, my dad kind of convicted me of not loving you enough. And so I'm going to turn that around. And I'm telling you right now that as my students, I love you as students. And we're going to turn this around, we're going to make this work. And it was the most powerful moment, I think, in my entire teaching career it happened twice. Um, once when I taught uh, 10th graders, and then another time when I taught in higher education, I had kind of a similar experience. The same thing came in the classroom and I said, I, I need to show you how much I love you. And so, uh, so both of those times, it was so, so critical. But you'll see concern, competence, similarity of interests. You hear about people when they go into interviews and they're supposed to scope out the room and see what connections that they have with the person that's interviewing them. This is true when you're connecting with anyone. And honestly, it comes back to listening and asking those questions. So we're gonna do one more waterfall activity here about voice. So as I'm asking the question, I, I, put, I didn't put the actual question here, I'm sorry, I should have redone this, but this was what was powerful to me. And so I wrote it. And then after the fact, I wrote the question to myself. Does my voice matter? As a student in your classrooms, does my voice matter? As a student in your, um, your teacher interns classrooms, do your students' voices matter? Those of you that might be also in K-12, if any of you happen to straddle uh, the, the, um, the systems like I do, 
do your students' voices in your institutions, in your K-12 institutions matter? And how do you show them? Um, so for the waterfall activity, uh, how can we prioritize student voice? And if you want to take this from the angle of in your classroom as a teacher of teachers, great. If you want to take it from a perspective of um, prioritizing student voice in the K-12 institution, great. Um, but how do we prioritize student voice? I want, to, I want to get at what are some of the strategies? What are the ways that we can prioritize student voice? And then I'll briefly share what we've done here um, in order to do so. So waterfall activity, how do you prioritize, prioritize student voice? We'll take a couple seconds to write that in. And then when I say waterfall, press enter. Provide a safe space for discussion. Listen to what students say and remember what they told you to incorporate they, their voice. Student choice. And remember, student choice had a lot to do with developing trust as well. Oops. Lots and lots of questions. Yes, indeed. Um, acknowledge voice by, pros by providing positive affirmations. Remember, we talked about that with Paul Zach as well, and also um, making sure that we recognize excellence. If you ask one twin a question, the other answer is don't accept that as your answer. Ah, yes. If you ask, same, right, for students. Just because one student says something doesn't mean that the other one agrees. Absolutely. We need to hear all voices individually. Let them work in small, stable groups to share frequently. Weave voices into every class. Make sure student is, every student is heard. Invite students into decision-making conversations. Provide opportunities for students to talk with a partner. Systematically gathering student input, analyzing it, creating action steps. Yes, yes, yes. Safe classroom for everyone to have a voice, listen and learn via student voice and honor their voice. Absolutely. Please, if you haven't um, provided uh, your feedback, please continue to feel free to do so. Just to share a little bit about what we've done. Um, prior to being in HR and equity, I was working with students from a career technical perspective as well as adult education. And so I found different forums and opportunities for students to share their voices. So among those, um, I worked with our local business um, our local business partners. So you know, similar to you probably have a chamber of commerce, and I actually was able to connect with our Valley Industry Association and provide students with a forum to speak directly to employers about their, um, their development and how they intend to move into the workforce. They are the future workforce. And I have provided the teachers at the same time of their, their teachers the opportunity to share about how they are working in the classroom to prepare their students for the future workforce so that our, our local business and industry um, community would feel comfortable with the way that we're doing our work and also have an opportunity as stakeholders to provide their input into education. Um, there's a, a, a gentleman that retired from the Department of Education that said that we've all had the we've had it all wrong all along um, from a perspective of who we serve and he says um, it's not that we it's not that we only serve students and parents in the community but we start we serve our business partners. Our product our students our product are our students. Um, so I thought that was beautiful. And uh, in addition to that, um, I wanted to kind of just share that a little bit about what we've done from an equity perspective since I've taken this role is we've actually developed for every single campus an equity uh, group. So what's actually called the um, diversity and equity uh, collaborative. So every single class, every single school rather has students whose sole purpose is to evaluate and impact equity on their campuses. And again, they have the opportunity to really elevate their voices in um, their individual schools and have an impact on the communications in that school. I'm going to actually fast forward because I see that I'm really short on time. I apologize. We're going to go past. So what, what, here, let me go back a little bit just so that you, you have the context. Um, Learning part partnerships started with reports, started with developing trust, but the second part of this is to become an ally. And so what are some of the attributes of an ally and what Dr. Hammond talks about is the warm demander. And so you have this chart available to you in the slides as well, if you wanna kind of investigate a little bit more deeply around what a warm demander is. 
Um, I was going to do an activity with you about being an ally and the keys to the academic kingdom, but I wanted to share that um, as a teacher of teachers, I ask a number of different questions of my students and my, my um, teacher interns have always, uh, almost always half of them will tell me that one of the reasons why they came to education or to become an educator is because they never had the opportunities that they wanna provide their students. And so as an ally, they recognize that they didn't have the keys to the academic kingdom. They didn't have that academic ease. And so think about if you would, how do you provide students those keys to the kingdom? What language do they need to have access to academia? And think about that both for our teachers, our future teachers, as well as for the students that they're going to be teaching, right? And then the final co um, component of this is that highest level on Bloom's taxonomy, right? So that cognitive insight. Um, and this is a, if you're, if you're into listening to a 15 minute podcast, I listen to one on my drive in to work every day. This is Rob Dial and he really talks about how to be successful. I'm actually gonna use this this semester with my teaching, with my credential students, excuse me. Um, I'm gonna be using little segments, you know, two or three minutes of his podcast um, to help inspire them. And one of the things that I talk a lot about with my students is metacognition and also the way that context converts, I'm sorry, text converts into context. This particular, um, uh, if you look it up, just look up Manifest Your Dream um, on YouTube, you'll find his podcast. But this particular one, he has this segment where he talks about how even the music that we listen to impacts our context in a long-term perspective. What about the um, and it impacts our ability to be successful. I'll leave you with this final slide that just gives you some of the resources that I've used in my research. And I apologize, I meant to take, to give you a good long break. But if you have any questions, I'm gonna stop sharing right now. I can see all of you. I apologize that I couldn't see your faces through the presentation, but I'm glad to see you now. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free. And if not, I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference and that this was a helpful and enjoyable uh, session for you and would love your feedback along the way. Um, Cheryl, do you, do you have anything else that you wanted to add? Uh, I just wanna say thank you and how excited I am for all of the ideas you shared and the concrete resources. Um, I put a link again in the chat to the folder of materials because there's great stuff in there. So if you missed that, be sure you take a look at it. And thank you so much, uh, Marianne, for your You're time welcome. Absolutely. preparation. My pleasure.